And now I want to sort of give you a review on my experience with this MacBook since I've had it. And there are still a lot more features that I want to go through and will bring to you. But um, so you're going through a trial run with me as I go through this. So there are a lot of things that I know about it. There are a lot of things that I don't. But hopefully we can get through this together. So let's start. Who out there is in the market for a MacBook Pro? I see about five hands. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right, so hopefully what I cover today will give you a little bit more insight on this computer. And again, I'm learning it as well, so we're learning this together. I look at this review from a user's point of view. What you see on the screen is an image of my new MacBook Pro sitting atop of my old MacBook Pro. That shows you the thickness and the thinness of my old one compared to the new one. The new one is so much easier to handle and carry and manipulate and just you just put it under your arm and you just go. It, it feels very light in your hands. It's only 15.5 millimeters thick. It's just four pounds and it just feels really light. It's more compact and that has some good points and bad. Uh, that means that a lot of things that we've come used to have gone by the wayside, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily bad because things have changed and Change is constant, and if you've ever read that book, Who Moved My Cheese, mm -hmm. you know that you have to move with the change. Uh, it says it gives up to 10 hours of battery life. I have not tested that yet, but I'm sure I will down the line. All right, cool. The keyboard was my biggest concern. I spend an enormous amount of time on the keyboard. I have a trackball which I use but I'm very fluent in using the keyboard to go from place to place. You actually work faster if you learn how to use the keyboard. So my concern was would I be able to type the same? Would it have the same responsiveness? Would I be just as quick as I am now? So most of my concerns were unfounded. The second generation butterfly keys gives you a, neat, a more even distribution. So sometimes if you, when you type, some people type on the sides of their fingers, you can still get the pressure and get the keys that you're touching. The keyboard is full size. It's backlit. Every single key is backlit, so there's not like one large panel in the background. My concern is the low travel. I learned how to type, you know, with your hands almost like a claw, and even with short fingernails, I find that my fingernails hit the surface around the keys. So after a while, that becomes a tad bit uncomfortable and painful. Um, if you don't have fingernails, you won't have that problem. But again, look at mine. They're very short, and I keep them short for, you know, typing. So that is my biggest issue with this. Otherwise, it has just been really easy. Oh, actually, there's one more thing. Um, on your keyboard, when you learn how to type, you know that there's the little indicators that you know where to position your fingers? On the low profile keyboard, they're very low as well. So sometimes I have to actually look to see where to position my fingers instead of the feel from the um, you know, other keyboards that I've been used to. Uh, with the scissors uh, keyboard, the travel distance was much higher. So I'm used to that. And also the sound 
the sound of the low profile keyboard, sometimes it actually sounds like you're pounding on it. It's a different sound. With the scissors, sometimes it can be silent, but these keys are not silent. They give you a feedback. So maybe I'll get used to it and it won't bother me, but this is a transition that I'm in. So I wanted to make sure that I brought that up because it I hear it, I feel it, and I see it, um, but it doesn't stop me from typing on this. Um, I still use it, but when I'm at home, I have a wired keyboard that I use <coughs> that works you know, for me. So that was my biggest concern. The track pad, the force touch track pad. It's large. It's very large. And there will be times when you will accidentally do something and you don't know you did it. So what I've done, I've gone into the system's preferences to change that. This actually is not the button that you're used to from the old track pass. This is actually capacitive glass and it's pressure sensitive. You can do a, a I want to say a click, but it's not really a click. And you can do this pressing anywhere on this trackpad, whether it be the upper left, lower right, in the middle, on the side, and it will always click for you. This is called a Taptic Engine. And I, from what I've read and from how I see you use this, there are going to be apps that are going to take advantage of this new trackpad. So let's give you an idea of how this works. I need to escape out of this to do this. All right, so let's enlarge this. So I'm going to just select the word means. With the force touch trackpad, uh, previously, if you wanted to look up something, you would either have to press like control, um, control right click on your mouse or on your keyboard. With this new um, force touch trackpad, if I press and then press and hold down, it then gives me a lookup. You can actually set commands for this to do other things. So that's one of the reasons I think other apps are going to be able to use this because the different touches allow different commands and then I just click. And let me do this, let me go into the settings, systems preferences to show you this. All right, so with the trackpad, you have your normal videos to show you how this trackpad works. And you can like change it, the lookup and data detector um, click that I just did, you can change it to either force click with one finger or tap with three fingers. Um, when you're using the force click with one finger, that will make sure that all of the commands are enabled. If you have this set to the tap with three fingers, sometimes you'll be trying to use this force touch trackpad. Say that five times really fast. No. And, mm -hmm. and it won't work. So this is the setting that you want to leave it on. Force click with one finger and then all of the commands that work will be um, in enabled for you. So when I first got this, it seemed really, really sensitive. I, as I was um, downloading my apps and, and working with documents, just the slide of my hand would do something. So it's too sensitive, that's very dangerous. You could delete something, call somebody, you know, you could do anything. So what I found is that I started playing around with these and once I set the click pressure to firm, that's when a lot of that nonsense stopped. So just a little tip, this is what worked for me, but I advise that you go into the preferences and play around to see um, what will work for you. Okay. So. Now this is an interesting feature, the touch bar. 
I thought the touch bar would be totally useless. And every time I went to the Apple store to try this out, I looked at it, I played around with it, and I thought, okay, I can do all of this on my keyboard, you know, just very quickly. Okay, so you have no choice if you buy a MacBook Pro 15 inch. This comes with the touch bar. You have no other option. So once I got the computer and started using it, I actually found this to be useful. And see if I can show you why. Uh, first of all, at the upper right hand corner, there is a fingerprint sensor. You can, through the system's preferences, set this fingerprint sensor just like you can on your iPhone. So it can unlock the computer. It can, um, you can use it to purchase things from the App Store, from the iTunes Store, and you can use Apple Pay with it. So you got a lot of power in that little finger now. You can also activate Siri from the upper right hand corner. Uh, this touch bar gives you contextual input. So what that means is that depending on the app that I'm in, it will give me different information. And let's see if I can show you this. Let's escape out of this. Let's go to QuickTime. So if you look here, you'll see the touch bar. Right now, because I have QuickTime on, it shows me that I can press to record, and I can choose the camera, and there's also the settings for brightness. I'm going to click that, and you'll see that it gives me the brightness setting. So I thought, okay, well, it took away the function keys that we were used to. Is this any better? Well, with the brightness setting, at home, I have my laptop connected to a external monitor. So now, when I press the brightness setting, it gives me the brightness for both the external monitor and my laptop. So I can do all of these at, or do both of them at one time, instead of then going to the side of the external monitor. So it's giving me a little more access. So let's close that out. So depending on what you're working on, you'll get different feedback from this touch bar. And if you do need the function keys, there's a function button down at the bottom left corner. And you press it, and there are your function keys. So a feature that I did not think that I would use readily, I'm finding that I'm using. And let's see one more if I select. Select here. Now that I've selected a word in Keynote, you'll see that the touch bar now gives me different information, small caps, and the styling. So it has actually been a very pleasant surprise and a delightful surprise to use this. I use it a lot, and I did not think I would like this feature at all. Any questions? Um, someone mentioned Chuck. Uh, one of the great touch bar features is that it gives you a scroll scrub bar when you are playing a YouTube or a QuickTime video. Mm -hmm. So when you are using the touch bar, and let's say you're watching a video on YouTube or a QuickTime video, um, it actually will give you a scrub line. So if you want to zip past it, something, um, maybe it's something you've watched before, um, it'll let you get right to there using the touch bar instead of trying to click and drag the, the cursor over. The scrub bar really is a cool feature of the touch bar. Okay, now if I want to change the preferences of the touch bar, you go to the system's preferences and you select keyboard. Select keyboard, and down at the bottom, customize control strip. So in addition to 
all of the commands that are here, I can add some that are not there depending on what app I'm in or whether I'm in the Mac OS. So it really has become a very delightful feature. It's not just decoration. So you can use it for work. You can use it, you know, for amusement. You can use it. Okay. So to do that, and I don't, I can't show you both of these at the same time. So if I wanted to customize, I would take any one of these icons, and if I drag it down to the bottom, see how I'm dragging it down? It's showing up on the touch bar screen. So I can't show you what's on my camera. So it's showing up on the touch bar screen, and once I release it, that new command is available to me. So you can customize it to whatever use you want. And at this point, it has a lot more functionality than just being a function bar with function keys. So it's been very, very useful. Yes, Richard. Well, I don't know. I haven't dragged all of them down. I'm sure at some point, I'm sure there are, but I don't know where they, what they are. I haven't decided to do something like that just yet. Yeah, but I'll let you know if I do. Okay, so let's go back. Yes. It is a touch screen because I can touch whatever I have here so it can do things. I can turn off, turn off the volume. I can, then let's go here. Let's go to this one. So like right now, I have, go back. I have Keynote on. I can skip a slide, I can zoom to fit, or I can do any of the commands here. So it is a touch screen. All right. All right. Got the answer? All right. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Here we go. All right, so next. Let's get through this. You can activate Siri. Now let me say this, and hopefully it will stop right here. I have a hub. Yeah, I know. I'm going to leave it there. I have a hub that I use, and I'll show you that hub in a second. And I thought Siri wasn't working because I connected it to a, my hub, and it was going through the audio of the hub. And again, it was the first time I'd used the hub, so there was a lot, um, still a lot that I don't know about the computer. So I thought Siri wasn't working. I looked through the sound preferences and I checked everything. So, like, here's an example of one of the hubs that you can use and, and purchase to work with the new laptops. And I'm going to talk to you about that in a second. But mine had a sound feature on it. So, if you get a hub that has a sound feature, make sure that. Um, internal mic is selected in your sound preferences. Otherwise, you'll think Siri isn't working as well. You'll see it, but Siri will not be able to hear you. Okay? All right, next slide, which preceded me. Retina display. The retina display is a feature that has been um, implemented on Mac devices. In this particular case, the native resolution of this MacBook Pro is 280, uh, 2880 by 1800 resolution. It is really nice to look at. I even looked at FaceTime and I went, wow, it is so different from my other computer. So the resolution is really good. Uh, it's 60%, 67% brighter than previous screens. Uh, it has 220 pixels per inch, and Apple is implementing what they're calling the wide color gamut. And the wide color gamut is 
it's allowing more color to be available to you. Typically, your devices use the color model sRGB. sRGB gives you so much of a range of the color um, model. Uh, the wide color gamut gives you a much larger. So this is why you can see things so vividly. And let me take a look and show you what I mean. Let's come out here. All right, I started looking at this website in my, on my old monitor, or I'm sorry, on my external monitor at home. And all I saw was an orange square. And there are some things that you cannot see because it is connected to that. <laughs> Let's see if I can find a way to show you this. Another way to show you this. Okay, let's go here. All right, this might be better. This image here, on my left, your right, it's showing you the sRGB screen. On my right, your left, it's showing you the new wide color gamut. And if I drag this bar to the left and to the right, you can see how the colors in this image change. What you're seeing on this side is the color gamut for um, devices before Apple inputted the wide color gamut. And let's see if I can show you another one. Yes? Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. Well, you know, the helpful part is that we can read. You see up at the top? <laughs> All right. Up at the top, you'll see which one is sRGB, and you should see one which is P3. Okay, yeah. Actually, so actually you're seeing it exactly the way I see it. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's why we always look at the screen when we're... Yes. All right. So on the left-hand side... You see how this flower is changing? Actually, you can't see it that well. Yeah, it's not. So let me see if... Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can... Yeah, the projector. You can see it? But actually, the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you can see it slightly. The, yeah, and it could be because also because the lights are on, because projectors do display the white color gamut. So let's see if there's one more I can show you. And this one. All right, you can see the vibrance just a, just a tad bit. Oh, big time. So you, after this is over, you're welcome to come on up and, and take a look. But yes, it, it's a very big difference here. Uh, this website, I will send you, the, I will put the link in the notes so that you can have it and see this. Um, The wide color gamut was actually created by Adobe. So the wide color gamut, and I wanted to make sure you knew this. Come here. The wide color gamut, the P3, is in the newest iPads, starting from the iPad 9.7 inch and up. It's in the iPhones 7 and up. It's in the newer iMacs, and it's in the MacBook Pro the latest versions. So with the older devices, you are only looking at the sRGB color gamut. With the newer devices, you're seeing much more color variations and richer colors than you are. Yes? 
Hope and pray. Hope and pray is not a um, uh, technical term. It's, it's, it's used a lot. Uh, I would imagine that you would have to um, calibrate your monitors, but I can't tell you. You know, this is, you know, this is still just as new to me as it is to you, so I can't tell you exactly what you have to do with it. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you that. I don't know. I don't know if there's a like a like a color profile file that you can send to them. I don't know. When I find out, I'll make sure to answer that question, but I don't know because you know it's a very legitimate question. But I know that right now with having this white color gamut on the screens and on the phones, you, they're really trying to get a better representation across these devices of what you're looking at. They're sort of, you know, trying to copy what the eye is seeing, which is a phenomenal task. But I don't know. Yes? That's sort of what she was asking. I can't tell you. I can't tell you that. All right. Yes. More layman What has this meant to you? How is that impacted your way of doing things? As far as this white color gamut, well, again, I've only had the computer for a couple of weeks. Um, I'm very impressed by what I see. And knowing, knowing that the printing and the LCD, are, you're looking at two different color models. You're looking at CMYK versus RGB. And for those people who print, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a lot that go in it. But for those of us who just take things from one mobile device to another mobile device, the colors are just so much richer. So I don't print a lot. I put a lot of things online or up, you know, up on a web or, or send them through so that they can be viewed from the computer. So this, seeing this, it's just an incredible change. So that's, a, that's the best answer I can give you regarding that. Okay. All right, let's see. Yes. Yes, sir. I do a lot of When you calibrate a monitor to use for the phone, you will normally get a little bit of information. You are able to do that. So you're saying that the um, P3 gamut is not available, and I wouldn't think that it's available totally to everyone right now. So you're using, you should use what's existing? Yes. Okay. So there's your answer for now. You have to use some of the color models that are existing. Wide color is new. And wide color, I believe, was in... Um, 
they're trying to mimic what you see from like the projectors and the television industry from what I understand. So it's possible that they're using it for when you're watching movies or, you know, when you're doing things that are basic, basically on these LCD devices or LED devices. Okay. So that's the best answer I can give you. This is, you know, I don't fully know. Thank you, Dan. All right. So next. And I don't know if you read this quote that I have on the screen by Apple Insider while we've been talking. Uh, I thought it was really interesting to read. And they're believing that um, Apple now allows photographers to see accurate reproductions of their work, regardless of where or how they choose to get work done. So there, there are amazing things that they intend for this new wide color gamut. This particular MacBook has two graphics cards. It has one that's integrated, and it has one that is called discrete. The discrete one comes into play when you're using, I want to say, graphic intensive applications, whether you're using um, a video editing program, a image editing program or 3D or gaming. So depending on what I'm using, if I, for example, screen flow is on right now, uh, I can go into activity monitor and see that screen flow is using the discrete graphics processor. So it's leaving the integrated processor alone to work with the other programs. So what that is giving you is it's providing performance and it's providing support for two entirely different processes, whether it's just, you know, your regular surfing or your regular email. And then when you turn on your high, high use program like Photoshop, it, Photoshop is using that graphics card. So it's not slowing your machine down. It's giving you, from what I found, a lot of power. Um, I've had ScreenFlow, Photoshop, and another program on at one time, and it didn't skip a beat. So I'm very happy with it. And it doesn't need a nice bag. You are correct. You are correct. So I'm not even going to explain that. If you missed it last month, you just missed it. You missed a really good... Um, no, it isn't. <laughs> it, it, it would be on the video had I not shut my computer down before I turned the video off. So, uh, notice, um, <clears throat> no comment here, no comment here, no comment here. All right. All right, moving on, moving on. Any questions so far about this? Yes, sir. Um, a lot. Um, I was positive a lot answered that too. Okay, and so, so what I did, I opened up Activity Monitor, shh, I opened up Activity Monitor to show you that, see, ScreenFlow is using the higher performance GPU, 
Everything else is using the integrated graphics processor that I want to say on the other side or for, for everything else. So it's there if you want it proof. Let's go back here. Ah, oh, you make me start all over. All right, Dave mentioned what's on this MacBook Pro. This particular MacBook Pro model comes with four Thunderbolt ports. It integrates data transfer, charging in both directions, video output into a single port. So what does all of that mean, you ask? You ask. Okay. So on either side, there are two ports here and two ports here. This is the adapter that I had to purchase, and I'll get into that in a second. So with this port, I can use this port to attach to other devices. In this particular case, I'm attached to this projector. I can also pull this out and put in the power cord. So I can put the power cord in any one of these ports. I can put the adapter dongle in any one of these ports. They're going both directions, so it doesn't matter which port I plug into. They all do the exact same thing. They both charge or they both allow the transfer of power in and out. So that was sort of cool. So this particular model can support two 5K displays connected to it. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, that got me thinking. <clears throat> but anyway, I can't think that hard. I bought a house, so you know where all my money goes. All right, you can daisy chain up to six Thunderbolt devices into either of these ports at one time. So one port supports six at one time. So there's a lot of power coming out of this computer. Now, the biggest change here for me was, now that I have these new ports, uh, Thunderbolt 3, USB-C, the different terms. Yeah. Well, there's different technology. Okay. Thunderbolt, think of FireWire as the faster than radio. The Thunderbolt is the new FireWire. USB-C plays USB. So it's just as fast. Beautiful thing. Okay. So the shape is You have a hard drive. Now, what it says that through these Thunderbolt 3 ports, I get 40 <coughs> gigabytes of throughput, which is eight times faster than USB. So, what does that mean for me? It says that in less than one minute, I can copy 14 hours of HD video. Ooh. It says that I can copy 25,000 photos in less than one minute. It says that I can copy 10,000 songs in less than one minute. So that's fast. Yes, Cap. So I'm glad you got it. Okay. When you move from your previous yes. to this one, yes. No. I'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> All right. So with these 
Newport. Obviously, I have older devices. I have an existing external monitor. I have an existing printer. I have an existing slew of things that I just did not want to have to replace. It was enough just purchasing this. You know, you don't want to have to shell out another wad of money to do that. So I decided to shell out a wad of money and buy a couple of adapters. And then the wad became very small. And let me show you what I, what I purchased. One was this one. And let's see if it'll, if I can go to this one. Uh, that's not where I wanted to go. Let's go back to you. Let's go here. On the Apple site, they list the power cables and adapters that you can purchase for use. And the one that I purchased was this one. All right, so let's see if it'll show you the connections. It has three connections available. The Thunderbolt, the HDMI, and a USB. So at this point, I can plug this adapter into my computer, and I have at least access for more devices and my older devices. Right now, my iPhone is connected through this adapter and you're seeing it through the USB connection. The projector is connected through the H, uh, HDMI connection. Now, what about my other devices? What about my scanner? What about my monitor? There was one hub that I purchased. And I, I'm looking for Four, one, two. I'm looking for the link and I cannot. There it is. Okay. This hub was purchased through OWC. It has 13 ports on it. And these ports saved me having to purchase new equipment, like a new scanner, new printer, new external monitor. Um, and let's see. New command plus. Give me a second. I'm, I'm getting there. I know you're anxious. All right. And see if I can. Let me go back here and bring this up. All right. I, I did not bring mine because it was all connected and you got to get under the table and all, all that. So I didn't bring it. So this is what the front of this hub looks like. It has a slot for a... Um, uh, smart SD card from the camera. So, you know, you take pictures, you're done, you just insert this into this hub. It also has a connection, and actually, let me go to, let me go, I'll get to the back in a second because, where are I? Hold on. There's a, there it is. All right, so. You have an SD card reader, you have an expanded analog audio in and out. Some of you may have a use for that and know what it's for. I don't use that much. There, um, no, actually, I'm sorry, that's not the one I was talking about. That is for headphones. The, the one I'm talking about is on the back. I'll, I'll get to that. Sorry, brain freeze. All right, so yes, I use this for headphones. This was the Port that Siri was listening for. This is why I thought Siri wasn't working because once I plug this hub in, Siri was expecting all audio to come in through this port. So I had to go into preferences and tell Siri to, to listen to the internal speakers instead of to this. Uh, it also has a USB 3.1 uh, connection on the front. On the back, it has four USB 3.1 one port. It has an S slash PDIF port. And I think, Dave, you when you saw that, you were sort of interested. What is that for? That's a digital normal port. 
your digital audio output or will be higher quality. So I have a Sonos system and Tunnel Vision on Mars, yeah, audio cable. It goes from there to there. When I love quality music or audio improve. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this hub also has a FireWire 800 connection. So I have a video camera um, that uses this connection. It has uh, Ethernet. It has two Thunderbolt 3 ports in the back. It has a mini display port in the back so I can plug my external monitor right into it. And then there's the power um, plug. So this particular adapter was not inexpensive but it was a lot less inexpensive than buying a new scanner a new printer a new monitor a new something 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 so i got it and it has just been seamless working with this hub and working with my computer so i highly recommend it if you're looking for something like this i highly recommend it any questions about this? Oh, and here's, a, here's another hub, very similar. This is one that you can carry around. It has some of the same ports. There's Ethernet and the Thunderbolt um, SD card, uh, USB, and HDMI. So this is just a portable one, but the one I purchased is to keep all of my devices working at home. Okay. This one is by Adam. This is that's mine. I got that what I call Mac Lite, and they often offer mm -hmm. me a, a combination of stuff that was handy for me. I didn't need a three hundred dollar thing in the box mm -hmm. solution to purchase what I need. And it was uh nine ninety five. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there are similar ones that have more. Okay. So, now I have Safari open. I want to show you what's showing up on my touch bar. Let's, come here, come here, there you go. All right. Do you see? All right. Switch, 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 switch. Where are you? Hold on. All right, there I am. So, uh, oh, I don't think it's going to show it this way then because well, let's give it a try. If I click here and let's, yeah, I'm going to minimize this. All right, cool. All right, so if you're looking over on our right, you got that right, you'll see in the touch bar, it's actually showing me every Safari tab that's housed in this Safari window. So if I wanted to select a tab, and let's see, is there one that I can show you and be okay with? All right, so let's see. Um, this one should be fine. So it becomes just just as easy to go from tab to tab to tab using the touch bar. Okay. All right. Yes, yeah, sir. Question. Yes. Say you're, uh, does the hardware change to represent programming? Yes, it does. Yes. Why don't they have that attribute in a computer? The touch bar? I don't know. Um, it could be a feature that is to get you into the MacBook Pros. I don't know. That's, you know, I haven't. It does. It replaces the function keys and it does a lot more.
Yes, it, it may be somewhere down the road. Maybe this is just a trial to see how it works, but it, it has uh, a lot of good functionality. And again, I didn't think I would like this feature at all. When I first saw it, I thought it was just something pretty and just bells and whistles, but it has turned out to be very functional. Yes, sir. I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Yes, you are able to customize the bar for each individual application. So, starting to work on you? You starting to feel it? All right. All right, let's go back to Keynote and. All right, let's see where I am. Okay, got that. <laughs> For audio, there is an audio port on the um, right hand side. See it connected here. And it works for audio in and I believe audio out. Dave. Can you answer that question for me? <coughs> audio port, does it work for audio in as well as audio out? Just in? Okay. Yes. Uh, it will do audio in. Yes. So then it, because I've done audio in with it. So it goes both ways. It works both ways then. All right, cool. We learned something today. All right, so, yes, we learned a lot of stuff. Okay, <laughs> okay. when, um, all right, he's busy, but when I had my hub plugged into it, and I plugged in my earphones, it also set in preferences external input. So it works both directions. All right, uh, microphones. For the life of me, I have done and spent an unreasonable amount of time trying to find out where the microphones are on this MacBook Pro. And it's still up in the air. Your guess is as good as mine. But I do believe that there is a microphone in the upper left-hand corner, escape, let me, of the touch bar. I believe there's a microphone right here. And Dave said that there's a microphone next to the camera, but I'm not sure. I've researched the Apple site and I've done, again, a ridiculous amount of searching. And there is no definitive answer to where these microphones are. Have you looked at iFixit? Yes. iFixit said that they, but they tore down a 13 inch and the um, speaker array was in the upper left-hand corner of the touch bar. So that's where I have not been able to find where it is on a 15-inch. So I want to make sure that I don't accidentally cover it up if I'm you know, doing something and I need the internal speakers. So Apple, hello. Let us know where they are. Yeah. All right. Yes, sir. What I'm seeing... I see less and less things that we used to have. Not many of many of us still hold on to. Like for instance, just you know, CDs which you put in or turn up the program. Um, when you buy uh, Microsoft Office Suite this year, you used to get a chip to uh, load it. All those kinds of things. Or to burn Okay, let me, let me stop you right there. Um, I know exactly where you're coming from. I said the same thing. That's why my previous MacBook is still sitting on my desktop. It will be used because it had the DVD drive, the, the optical drive, and all of that stuff. Uh, I believe the catalyst behind this was to make things thinner, make it easier to carry. Um, there are some things that are good about it, people feel there are some things that are bad about it that people feel. Um, when it's your ball, you get to do what you want. And that's what they're doing. 
So hold on, I'm, I'm not taking any more questions right now because I want to get through this. So, so I feel you, I feel your pain and I'm right there with you, but um, I do have other things that can do that and you can buy and I look at some of this as like, okay, are they just trying to get us to shell out more money? Possibly, you know, I don't know, but that's what's happening. But again, who moved my cheese? So, yeah, so that's, I'm going to leave that right there. And I'm going to get through the rest of this because I, 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 I want you to listen to this. I was impressed with the speakers. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to un unplug this. So hold your ears. Okay. I'm going to unplug this because I want you to hear the speakers. Okay. Silence, please. I think they're nice. Could you hear them out there? Yeah, they're small. All right. And they're small. So I think the speakers are very nice. Okay. MacBook Pro 15 inch, 2017. It has a lot of bells and whistles. It has the latest processor. It has four cores. This one has a one terabyte solid state drive. It has 16 gigabytes of RAM. That's the maximum amount of RAM on these laptops. Uh, are we looking for more? Those of us who really use these for graphics, multitasking, and video, and 3D, and so forth. Yes, we'd love it. Apple's kickback is that you're talking a uh, shorter battery life, you're talking a bulkier machine, you're talking a bunch of different things that the reason that they went to this thinness. I'm happy with this machine. Even with 16 gigabytes of RAM for a portable laptop, I am very happy with it. And I, you couldn't be more picky than I am. She knows me. She, she has known me for over 30, almost 40 years, she knows me. So if I say I'm happy with it, it's a, I'm sorry? Yeah, we were infants. Yeah, we're infants, yeah, we're 42. Yeah, yeah. so hush up over there, peanut gallery. All right, so anyway, I maximized the configuration of this uh, laptop because I need to for things that I do. And your mileage may vary depending on what you need your machine for. So I got the biggest and the best, latest and greatest that they could give out knowing that, you know, maybe in two months it'll be different. I'll be, you know, has been. But I like this machine. Was there anything as far as a deal breaker in purchasing it? No. It is a really good machine. <coughs> All right. Now, to bring up Cal's question. Clean install. Why do I do a clean install? I have done a clean install for maybe the last 20 years on my Macs. I do not migrate. This is me. You may have a different view on this. But one of the reasons I do not in, uh, migrate is because I don't want files, clutter, and garbage migrating over to my new machine. Having files that are not made for your system will do some crazy things to your system. I've even done a clean install on an older machine just reinstalling the system. And doing a clean install made that machine run as different as night and day. Since that time, I have never done a migration. How hard is it to do a clean install? I found it this time was a lot easier than I expected. Why? because I have a lot of items stored in cloud services. Um, iCloud, having the preferences stored there and having you know the mail, the contacts, everything, everything just came down seamlessly. When I came in today, I did not have to put 
the password for the Wi-Fi into this machine because I had it stored in iCloud preferences in my old machine. So it just transferred that information over. So anything that was in the cloud just came right down to this machine without a hitch whatsoever. So I made sure that I knew where, where my passwords and serial numbers were stored because I downloaded new, fresh, all of my apps. Not a single one did I copy over, maybe one. All right, but maybe one, then that was it. So all of the Adobe apps, I downloaded. I downloaded 23 Adobe apps. It took just a smidgen over an hour to do all of that. I have my files stored in, um, it could be iCloud or it could be Dropbox or it could be some of the others. So with iCloud and Dropbox, they, just, they are just right there, available to you. All you have to do is have that app open up and your files are there. I do not store my files in Apple's Documents folder. I store my files in Dropbox folder because when I need to do a clean install, all of my files would have to be copied over. Well, if they're already in Dropbox, all I have to do is open the app and they're there. So I'm not migrating anything. If the only issue that I did have was with um, mail, because with mail, I have uh, mail stored on iCloud and separately off inside uh, my computer on, in mail. So that was the only file that I had to carry over. And after I copied that file from its location from my old computer, I just imported it into mail and everything popped right in. So I got the same settings. Uh, even with iTunes, uh, I have iTunes, my iTunes on a separate uh, external drive. If you start iTunes and hold down the option key, iTunes app will ask you, where do you want me to go? And from there, I selected my external drive. Let me quickly show you that. I got an image for that. I got an image for that. Come here. So clean install. Go back. Go where'd you go? There you go. So here. Because I have iCloud, not iCloud, because I have iTunes on an external drive, if I hold down the option key and launch iTunes, it asks me where's the library that I want. So all of my playlists, all of everything comes right in and into here. So I don't have to recreate anything. I did not have to recreate anything. I was really surprised at how smooth this went. And it was because of cloud services and because I have items on external drives and I don't have a lot of um, things stored on my computer other than the applications that I download. So every application that I use, I download it fresh. If um, I, I didn't have a problem with them, I inputted the credentials, the username and serial number, boom, everything worked. So that's why I don't migrate because I'm bringing in garbage and garbage will slow your computer down and it may stop it. So I do not migrate. But then, yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. The MacBook migrating from another device to the MacBook can be problematic. Files that the system Flat doesn't out. use. Yeah. And the, the big issue is, especially people that try to do it wirelessly, I just tell them don't do it because it's going to get 98% of the way and then it's going to fail. Make sure that you're hardwired between the two, but you have to have the right connections to make it happen. I've tried it several different ways. Okay. And when I do that, the only thing I'll find is the patient's 
Gotcha. Okay. okay. You summarize. So he was trying to move data from a 13-inch MacBook Air to a 12-inch MacBook, and he was having difficulties getting it to come over. Um, you know, one way would have been just copy it to a drive and then move the drive over to the other machine. But you, because of metadata issues, things could change there, and you need to protect that. Um, a lot of folks that have this issue in this case here, it's, it is related to the fact that the MacBook is a slightly different beast than other products. It's a great little computer, but migrating data from one to the other, the MacBook has its own set of challenges compared to moving from a 13-inch Air to a 13-inch Air or a MacBook Pro or an iMac. Those typically run fairly well. All right, and let me say as, I, as I'm ending up, that uh, I also have um, Adobe Creative Cloud. And there are settings that you can store within Adobe Creative Cloud. So the customized settings that I have also seamlessly came over. So I'm finding that these cloud servers are be, services are being just as helpful with this new laptop as having you know, iCloud and having you know, Dropbox and having the other cloud services. So this is what made my um, install of this machine so seamless and so easy to do. So with that, did you learn anything? Mm -hmm. All right. I hope I was. I hope I was helpful to you. Thank you.